So when the first Congress of Art History commenced in, eight, in 1873, in September, the opening speech by Rudolf von Eitelberger was followed by an address by Karl Schnaser. Schnaser was, in fact, too old and infirm to come to the event in person. Born in 1798, he was already 75 years old, and he died two years later. And so his address was read out to the assembled scholars. It was a reflection on his own achievements, as well as a commentary on the current state of the discipline, which he noted had only really been in existence for about 30 years. At the heart of Schnauzer's observations was the comment that there seemed to be a break between the generations. Younger scholars seemed to have a different set of preoccupation from those of Schnauzer and his contemporaries. Specifically, Schnauzer noted, he had been concerned with describing the inner unity of art, whereas younger scholars no longer seemed to share this interest. And I quote, perhaps we gave too much weights to the whole, but now there is a stronger emphasis on the plethora of individual details and on critical distinctions, close quote. There were several problems with this, he argued. First, the specific and the general were interdependent, a theme that had been central to the idealist philosophical tradition to which he was heir, and the focus on individual details without the bigger picture was uh, only a one-sided approach. Second, he complained, current times were marked by a lack of what he called the lively activity of the imagination. Our time, he continued, and I quote, is hardly familiar with the elusive word enlivened by the accommodating power of imagination of the recipient. Rather, it demands material, naturalistic or documentary, tangible or measurable truth. Close quote. This ran entirely counter to what he imagined to be the purpose of art history and the teaching of art which should be concerned, he stated, with, and I quote, liberating and strengthening the flights of the imagination, not with weighing it down with the additional ballast of words and facts. For Schnaser, the study of the history of art was intimately connected with contemporary practice, and this was a theme that had been central to his, uh, his major works, which was the Niederländische Briefe of the 1830s and his multi-volume Geschichte der Bildenden Kunst, uh, completed between 1843 and 1864. And there was an organic connection between the past and the present, he argued. So art history was a kind of aesthetic education. His address was thus an appeal to resist the drift towards a much more um, objective, unesthetic approach to art history. His speech or his address was received politely, but it was basically ignored. The participants gathered at the Congress sent Schnauzer a formal greeting whom they refer to as the Nestor of German art history. And of course, if any of you are familiar with uh, Homer's Iliad, you know that whenever Nestor starts giving a speech, it's time when everybody else starts to kind of ignore him as a kind of, of an irrelevant old man. But then they moved on to the business of the meeting and nothing more was said in response to his concerns. And this is no surprise, because in the same year, Moritz Tausing was appointed Professor of Art History in Vienna, and he delivered his famous lecture on the status of art history as a science. The lecture is often cited because of Tausing's emphatic rejection of aesthetic judgment in art historical research, the very opposite of everything Schnauzer stood for, perhaps. But here of greater relevance is his assertion that art history is, and I quote, an exact science based on the precise study of monuments, which he described as a process of, and I quote again, precise examination and continual comparison similar to that of the natural sciences, the most tangible of the science sciences. Tausing's lecture represented perhaps the high point of the capture of the humanities by the ideology of positivism. The formulation of the idea of positive science is most often attributed to Auguste Comte, whose course in positive philosophy, published between 1830 and 1840, was uh, enormously influential. 
Doubtless, he had some role to play in shaping emerging conceptions of art historical practice in Vienna in the mid-19th century. Hint, he was certainly being read. However, I'm using positivism here in a looser sense to denote an epistemological position based on the priority of the observation of particulars and reliance on inductive reasoning as central to the understanding of scientific inquiry. It stood at odds with the speculative metaphysics of idealism. It could be observed shaping the agenda of the Congress, in which a central preoccupation was the establishment of a proper infrastructure of objective scholarly study, including rigorous documentation of visual sources, as well as the adoption of scientific approaches to the restoration of works of art. During the previous two decades, Eitelberger had spent considerable energy building up Vienna as a center of just such scientific study. It was visible, for example, in his studies in the 1850s on the medieval architecture of Dalmatia and of Hungary, or in his topographical surveys of Austria-Hungary. In the 1870s, he launched the Quellenschriften, critical editions of historical textual sources. Positivism was also by no means limited to Vienna. Even in Austria-Hungary, there were other scholars outside of the capital who played a leading role in establishing positivistic norms of inquiry. One of the most prominent was Alfred Voltmann, who had published a landmark study of Holbein based on the most up-to-date notions of objective, precise, and critical study of sources. In Hungary, too, Imre Henselmann, a counterpart perhaps to Eitelberger as the founder of Hungarian art historical research, pioneered the systematic documentation of works of art and architecture. The 1873 Congress is thus significant for two reasons. First, it confirmed the central role of Vienna as a leading site of art historical scholarship internationally, I should add. Second, it marked the decisive turn away from the speculative and synoptic art histories of figures such as Schnauzer and to the more scientific and supposedly objective attention to empirical materials. Now, most immediately, we can connect the positivism of mid-19th century Vienna to the pioneering studies of Karl Friedrich Rumor and Gustav Wagen. Wagen, in his 1822 study of the Van Eyck brothers, and Rumor in his Itali Italienische Forschungen, uh, published between 1827 and 1831, sought to suspend reliance on aesthetic and moral judgments in order to focus solely on verifiable factual sort sources. Rumor, for example, singled out Vasari for his reliance on gossip uh, and unreliable sources, and he introduced the use of footnoted references. Wagen and Rumor were, in turn, informed by the work of historians such as Bartold Georg Niebuhr and Leopold Ranke in Berlin, who pioneered critical textual study as an essential tool of historical scholarship. It's consequently possible to trace a line from Tausing to Rumor and Wagen and figures such as Niebuhr and Ranke. In addition, it would be important to cite the key role of Theodor Sickel and the Institute of the Austrian Historical Research, where Eitelberger and art history were originally located. The Institute, founded in 1854, was modelled on the École Nationale des Chartes in Paris, which had been set up in 1821, uh, its focus being the direct study of historical manuscripts and other written historical documents. It had established a new model for working with primary sources. Its teaching included, for example, paleography, sigilligraphy, numismatics, historical geography, understanding of historical systems of weights and measures, civil, canonical and feudal law, archival and library science. Now, an obvious question to ask of this tracing of lines of intellectual ancestry might be what is to be gained from it, since it always uh, also runs the risk of itself being little more than a kind of positivistic documentation of disciplinary history. Now, I think there are two reasons why it's important to emphasize this lineage. 
First, it might lead us to rethink what we mean when we talk of the Vienna School. For many scholars, Vienna School art history is associated with the extensive theoretical innovations pioneered by Alois Riegel or Franz Wickhoff, ranging from the concept of Kunstwollen to Wickhoff's investigation into narrative representation, or indeed, later, Hans Sedelmeier's concepts of structured seeing or gestaltete Sehen. However, I wish to suggest that this offers a very partial picture of Vienna art history, for which positivism remained a central strand. This includes not only the earlier decades of its development associated with the Eitelberger, Tausing and their contemporaries, but also its subsequent history. Riegel's early textile studies, for example, exemplify this tradition. And uh, recently I, I attended a, a really excellent lecture by a Polish scholar called Anna Głowa on this topic, look, looking at the very detailed research uh, that Riegel undertook into Coptic textiles in the late 80, 1880s and 1890s. And we can find also um, adherence to the ideals of positivism in unexpected places. Josef Stchigowski, for example, in his numerous explanations of his method, always founded it on what he called kunde, the positivistic establishment of basic facts about the objects he was studying. And it's worth recalling in this context, too, that the first synoptic account of the Vienna School, written in 1910, not by an Austrian or a German, but by a Czech author, I would say that, wouldn't I, given where I am, but Vincenz Klamarsch, identified Vienna art history, above all, with precise, objective and factual research. But in addition to questioning what we even mean when we talk about the Vienna School, emphasis on its positivistic heritage casts light on its ideological and political function. It's hardly original to state that Eitelberger and art historical scholarship more generally in art history were beneficiaries of the educational reforms introduced by Count Leo Thun, and positivism was an important component of this too. In fact, as Franz Villafer and Johannes Feichtinger have pointed out in an important book about positivism, the idea of positive knowledge was already established in Central uh, Europe even in the 18th century, and this only intensified with the formats. In 1818, for example, Metternich launched the Jahrbücher der Literatur, but this was no exercise in speculative aesthetics or literary criticism. Rather, it was intended to promote observation and careful description as an antidote to speculation. And as an example of this, we can also cite perhaps the astronomer Karl Josef von Littrow, who taught natural science at the University of Vienna and was also director of the, director of the observatory. For Littrow, the origins and ultimate purpose of the universe were a matter of mere speculation and were mysterious and unknowable. Consequently, he argued, scientific inquiry should limit itself merely to deciphering the sequential, observable and predictable workings of the natural world. It was in this context, too, that philosophy was marked by a strong anti-idealism. One of the most influential thinkers in this regard was Johann Friedrich Herbart, a marked critic of Kant, especially of the latter's theory of the faculties of mind, which uh, Herbart criticized for its lack of precise description. Indeed, in his magnum opus, Psychology as a Science, published in the mid-1820s, Herbart sought to establish a new theory of the mind by analogy with the natural sciences. And when Count Thun launched his educational reforms in the 1850s, it was the spirit of Herbartian science he sought to invoke. Now this provides a context against, we can, against which we can view the history of the Vienna School, and indeed the conference. And it, ex and it displayed a similar growing momentum, culminating in the 1870s, and as a parallel to art history, it's worth noting that in 1874, one year after Tausing gave his lecture, Franz Brentano was appointed as professor of philosophy at the University of Vienna. As, the, as suggested by the title of his magnum opus, Psychology from an Empirical Standpoint, Brentano sought to establish a scientific empirical philosophy 
based on the notion of truth as evidence. Now, commenting many years later on the dominance of empiricism in Austrian inquiry, the Israeli philosopher Gershon Weiler commented as follows, and I quote, philosophy turned neutral, science-oriented, analytic, positivistic, and on the historical map, Aristotelian and Humean. Not idealist, not ideological and distinctively lacking in the Begeisterung, so characteristic of much German philosophy of the period, philosophy was Austrian at last. Whether Aristotelian or Humean, Austrian philosophy is typically philosopher's philosophy. Yet this was a misleading conclusion because positivism and empiricism were instrumentalized by the state. And this explains why Thun was a supporter. The emphasis on sober empirical observation was not only a powerful theoretical antidote to idealism, insulating inquiry from broader speculative thinking in metaphysical or theological domains, it was also deemed to be politically safe. And conservatives like Thun held that the emphasis on objective, observable, and verifiable facts would make scholarship immune to political manipulation, in other words, mobilization in the service of liberalism. Austrian positivism, whether in philosophical or art historical discourse, was thus a supremely ideological construct, since the meaning of the ideal of positive science was far from being politically neutral. This explains, too, how it would be adopted as a key value in art history. The usual explanation of Tausing's advocacy of objectivity and empiricism is that it was driven by anxiety over the need to demonstrate the legitimacy of this new discipline. Tausing expressed his worry that the involvement of aesthetic judgment in art historical inquiry, and I quote, creates the impression that history of art represents a sort of intellectual sofa, a sort of snack which carries with it, with it the threat of indigestion. This is undoubtedly true uh, about Tausing's motivation, but it misses the point that in a state in which questions of national culture and belonging were becoming the focus of toxic argument, the ideal of objective scientific research could provide a politically neutral terrain of discourse and cultural understanding. Rather like the figure of the emperor himself, it could stand above the fray of ill-tempered debate and competing interests. Yet it was not only conservative representatives of the Habsburg state that sought to mobilize scientific objectivity as a bulwark against what was often dismissed as pseudo-knowledge. For adherence to empirical positive science also became a hallmark of liberal intellectuals since it could draw on older enlightenment in deals of, uh, ideals of rational progress, as well as serving reformist critiques of clerical authority and the Catholic Church. And it would remain so into the 1930s, and it was viewed by, as such by its enemies. Much later, in 1934, when representatives of the regime of Engelbert Dollfuss attacked the logical positivism of Vienna Circle philosophers such as Rudolf Carnap, Moritz Schlick and Hans Hahn, the members of the Circle defended their work by arguing that they were not politically motivated and that they were concerned only with objective philosophical analysis. In the eyes of their detractors, it was precisely this that made them suspect, however, since such dispassionate, supposedly objective inquiry was associated in their eyes with the ideological program of social democratic politics. The Vienna Circle was closed down and its members either fled or in the most extreme cases were murdered, as happened to Schlick. Ultimately, Positivism and empiricism gained traction as an epistemological position due to their amenability to various political and ideological agendas, some of which were completely opposed. This helps us understand why a liberal such as Eitelberger, who had expressed openly pro-revolutionary views in 1848 when editor of the Wiener Zeitung, and a Catholic conservative such as Thun could reach a point of convergence in university reform, championing the same practice but for quite different reasons. And we might bring Tchaikovsky back into the discussion here, 
For while he's been long discredited for his political views, he could legitimately claim that with his emphasis on Kunda, he was standing in this tradition. In his lectures on the origins of early Christian art, he coined another term, Wesensforschung, and he declared, and I quote, what I call Wesensforschung is built up on the basis of historical facts and has nothing to do with aesthetics or so-called general art theory. Now, to suggest that Stchigovsky belongs in the same intellectual tradition as Tausing might appear to be preposterous, but the rhetoric he used to describe his approach clearly indicates that this was how he saw himself. And in so doing, he also revealed the basic theoretical difficulty of positivism. positivism. For already in the 1820s, it was being subjected to criticism, and from no less a figure than Rumor. In the foreword to his Italienische Kunstforschung, and he noted, and I quote, as experts know, documentary research leads into individual details. Thus, the result of my own acquiries fell apart into a series of ragged articles, and I didn't know how to give them any external coherence. It therefore seemed all the more important, therefore, to determine right from the start the point of view from which I was addressing individual examples. Hence, beyond what I wanted and originally intended, I was prompted to delve into the domain of theory. And the first two chapters of his book were, in fact, devoted to broad conceptual and theoretical ruminations on art. Now, Rumor's solution was to account his, uh, couch his account of Italian art in Schelling's philosophy of art. But here, what is of more interest is the basic methodological uh, dilemma he identified, namely the problem of inductive reasoning. Already in the 18th century, figures such as David Hume and Gottfried Leibniz had expressed skepticism regarding the reliability of drawing general conclusions on the base of the basis of the empirical observation of particulars. But it's a more concrete that's of, um, but the clearest exhibition of the problem was provided here in Vienna, much later in Karl Popper's lecture, Science, Conjectures and Refutations. It was delivered, in fact, in London in 1953, but it was based on his philosophical writings of the 1930s, produced when he was still working at the University of Vienna. And his comment is worth citing here in full because it sums up with admirable clarity the basic problem. And I quote, The belief that we can start with pure observations alone without anything in the nature of a theory is absurd. I tried to bring home the same point to a group of physics students in Vienna by beginning a lecture with the following instructions. Take pencil and paper, carefully observe, and write down what you've observed. They asked, of course, what I wanted them to observe. Clearly, the instruction, observe, is absurd. Observation is always selective. It needs a chosen object, a definite task, an interest, a point of view, a problem. And its description presupposes a descriptive language with property words. It presupposes similarity and classification, which in turn presuppose interests, points of view, and problems. Although they didn't express criticism of this kind, in this kind of language, it was undoubtedly weaknesses such as this that led Riegel, Wickhoff, and the generation of art historians reaching professional maturity in the later 1890s to, some, to search for some kind of theoretical foundation for their own work. It also indicates why the suggestion that Tchaikovsky was heir to Tausing is so outlandish, for even if his version of Wesensforschung was based on factual empirical observation, his object choice was ideologically driven and hence anything but objective. Now, I don't wish to explore Popper's answer to the problem of observation and induction in depth, for his own solution turned out to be problematic. But I do wish to bring the question of the ideological function of positivism in art history up to date. And I've just got a few concluding comments. For empirical factual research is still dominant in the scholarly traditions of many places, in particular in Central and Eastern Europe, where I work in the Czech Republic. I think it's also alive and well in Austria, I should add as well, but I probably shouldn't say that too loud. 
In an earlier discussion of this issue, I suggested the reason for this lay in the persistence of Vienna School thought in Czech art historical scholarship. After all, Kramar's overview suggested that for art historians in Prague, Brno and elsewhere, it was the objective method that was the hallmark of Vienna art history. And certainly, uh, Vienna was looked to by many uh, by generations of Czech art historians throughout the 20th century. But there's perhaps another reason why positivism is still so strong there, uh, although it cannot be derived from Vienna's school traditions, but it is connected in as much as it indicates once more the ideological weight that can be attached to apparently objective art historical observation and analysis. Three years ago, the Prague art historian Milena Bartlova published an important study of the state of art history in Czechoslovakia in the 1950s and 1960s. Because it was published in Czech, I can guarantee it will have very few readers outside of the Czech and Slovak Republic, uh, republics, which is a pity, because it identifies important characteristics of art historical writing that pertain not only in the Czech context, but more widely. Bartlova identifies the emergence in this period of a kind of neo-positivism, driven what she terms theory fatigue. The theory of question, of course, was the state-mandated adoption of socialist realism. Neo-positivism in this context could be understood as a reaction to the politicization of art history. And in this sense, there is a parallel perhaps, between the neo-positivism of the socialist states in the 1950s and 60s and the embrace of positivism a hundred years earlier in the Habsburg Empire. Except that in the first stance, it was a, in first case, it was a top-down stance encouraged by the state, uh, except in contrast to, to, sorry, the first example of, of, of um, Czechoslovakia, it, it was a top-down stance encouraged by the state as a means of circumventing the impacts of liberals and other opponents. In socialist Czechoslovakia, in contrast, neo-positivism was instead a kind of resistance, a refusal to engage, and it was also a survival strategy. Challenges from official circles could be warded off by reference to the scientifically rigorous nature of the scholarship. This was particularly about uh, the Czechoslovakia, but a similar narrative, narrative could be told of Poland, Hungary, and many other states that were subjected to socialist rule. We could almost describe it as a kind of inner emigration. And alongside this methodological retreat, there was also a retreat by many into seemingly esoteric topics. Medieval art, for example, was a common choice, because uh, which by their distance from the past, could attract limited attention from bodies responsible for scrutinizing and censoring academic output. Now, this has taken us a long way from the Congress of 1873, that, but it reminds us that consideration of the latter throws up in interesting and perhaps unexpected ways the intertwining of art historical scholarship, state interests, and the wider ideological underpinnings of research in art history and the humanities. Thank you.